Again, we're doing a series here in the month of March about the physician. Jesus is the the great physician. Uh, We've said several times that healing is not just a random act of kindness that God does. It is promised in Scripture. It is a part of the atonement, redemptive work of Christ. Atonement means reparation or amends for something moral or physical. Webster's Dictionary. And so we have looked at many promises. Last week we looked at the the ability of God, the willingness of God, the availability of it today. And this week we'll look at the, the price for good health. You know that... Uh, In week one, and we've repeated this verse every week, in Hebrews 13, 8, I've not had it as one of the texts on the screen or in your handout every week, but, and and you're going to have several scriptures not in it, because we've got a lot of them to touch, and and I've got to move real real quickly. But uh, we have said that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we believe that. Uh, I I believe that. I, I believe that is because the word is true. You know, if this is not true, then the resurrection won't be true. You know, if you can't believe in healing, how are you ever going to believe in the resurrection? I mean, how are you going to believe the graves are going to burst open and the dead are going to rise if you can't believe in healing? And so that uh, it's obvious that you can look around and you can see. Now, you know, your faith's not based upon your experiences, but let's just, let's just talk about the experiences that the church is having today for just a brief moment. And we could say that if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and if he is, if he is the same, why are our results so different? Now, I'm going to give you two, but I think they're the two biggest, and I could give you others. I could probably, I could, I could spend a couple weeks talking about reasons that people don't get healed but these two are huge they are pervasive they affect the church at large they 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 affect the time in which we live in it's generational but that doesn't make the word any less true but if you know where you're missing it well then you can you can quit stumbling over the same things over and over again Now, again, because it's necessary. Now, again, I'll tell you, you can't build your faith based upon your experiences because experiences are, they're they're, they're fickle. We live in a fallen world. Faith comes as a result of looking at God's word and knowing what his will is. And so, you know, sometimes we just, you know, what we do is that we reason these things. Well, now, and we'll think about something else. Okay, that makes sense. Now, I'm all for things making sense if it's based upon truth. All right? If I told you that 2 and 2 was 22, you'd say, well, Bill, that's funny, but it's not true. It doesn't make any sense. So I want to make sense. But we want that sense to be based upon truth. Scripture is the authority, not church history, not church tradition, not church doctrine. The scripture is the authority on things concerning faith, period. I don't care if they're on TV. I don't care if they've written 20 books. I don't care if they're Evangel, Yale, or Harvard. The word is the authority. Jesus Christ is the same. What? Yesterday, today, and forever. Now I've got to do these. We're going to look at all these instances where somebody either came to Jesus or they brought him. All right? There are ten of them. We'll look at nine of them very quickly. We find that early on in the book of Matthew. Now these are not. There are 27, in, there are 27 instances of people coming to Jesus or Jesus stopping and dealing with people. There are ten that are brought. 27 healings and miracles. All right? There are ten other places in Scripture where it says he healed them all, every one of them, or just in general he healed their diseases. 
Ten more. That together is 37, and that's just in the Gospels. This is not an idle thing. Again, these are not random acts of kindness. When Jesus came to this earth, it says he went about all the towns and villages teaching, preaching, and healing. That was his threefold earthly ministry, teaching, preaching, and healing. So we find this. Two blind men. In Matthew 9th chapter, all I can do, there's the scripture reference. You say, that's not my handout because it wasn't room, but I'm going to move through these. Matthew 9, 27 through 29. According, you'll notice I emphasize, your faith, let it be unto you. How did the two blind men get healed? Did they get healed because of Jesus' faith? Did they get healed because there was power there? Did they get healed because, you know, because, because of some extraordinary thing was happening? No. Right here it says they got healed, but he says, according to your faith, let it be unto you. The Roman centurion, he had a servant at home, and he's dying. And he comes to Jesus, he says, heal my servant. He says, I'm I'm a man under authority. And he also says, if you will, I'm a man in authority. I say to one, go and he go, another come and he come. Jesus said this, I have found, I have not found such great faith. He's saying the Roman centurion has great faith. I can show you scriptures where Jesus said they had no faith or little faith. Faith can be measured. You can have a little faith. You can have weak faith. You can have strong faith. You can have great great faith. Faith can be measured, but until you believe it can be measured, you will do nothing to improve it. I've left my teaching. I've gone to preaching. He says, great is your faith. As you what? As you believe, so let it be done to what? What you believe, it'll be done. Was it on his faith? No. It's on the centurion's faith. The Canaanite woman had a daughter at home. She said she was possessed of a devil, greatly tormented. He says, she said, come to my home. Jesus didn't even pay any attention. Listen to me. Be relentless. Uh, there'd be another one. Be relentless. Well, I'm just going to stay with the two, okay? <laughs> Do you understand? It says this. He didn't even pay her any attention. I'm telling you, you stay in there until you get attention. He says, he's a woman. She said, he said, you know, finally, he, he looked at her and said, you know, it's not right. Listen, he even insulted her. He said, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. See, she's a Syrophesian. She's a Canaanite woman. She's a Gentile. That's that's how Jews saw Gentiles. It was not a real bizarre statement. She understood exactly what he's saying. He says, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, yeah, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the masters or the children's table. And when she said that, he said, oh, great is your faith. Let it be unto you as you desired. And her what? Now, whose faith was great? Was his faith great? Of course, his faith was great. All right? Just in case somebody wanted to wander off into the tree somewhere. Yeah, his faith was great. But he said to her, great is your faith. Let it be unto you what? As you desired. And her daughter was healed that very hour. You know the story of the paralyzed man. He's got four friends. Four friends bring him in. And there's not enough, enough room to get in the front door, so they tear up the roof. All right? Now, we will always leave room at the front door. <laughs> when, they, when these four friends, they, when, they, when they could not find how they might bring him in, they went on, on the housetop and they let him down with the bed through the tile in the midst before Jesus. And then it says this, and when he saw their faith, their faith. The woman with the issue of blood, Luke the 8th chapter, verse 43, says she'd suffered many things of many of the physicians. She, she, she had spent all that she had. She was not any better. She continued to grow worse. She said this to herself, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. She came behind. There was a crowd oppressed. The people were so thick they were pressed against Jesus. She fights her way through the crowd. There is a struggle. Can I tell you? There, it, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to tell you it's not a struggle. You know, the sickness leads to eventually is to death. You know what death is? Death is the last enemy. That you're supposed to fight. But we're fighting to win. The woman with the issue of blood in Luke the 8th chapter. So she came behind the press. She touched his garment. 
Jesus said, who touched me? Oh, she's trembling. And, and he said, daughter, be a good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Mind you, there's, there, did I tell you that there are ten times that somebody came to Jesus or was brought to Jesus, okay? No, twelve. There was twelve. There's twelve of them. Twelve times somebody that came to Jesus or was brought to Jesus. Now, there's a lot of places that he stopped here and there and he saw somebody and he healed them. Uh, but we're talking about where he was approached. See, when you're sick and you're going to pray, you're approaching Jesus. When you got somebody, you're approaching them on your behalf, you're, you're approaching Jesus. J. Iris, you know, the same story with the woman in the issue of blood. J. Iris' daughter's dying. They say, J. Iris, it's too late. It's too late. It's too late. How many times do you hear? It's too late. It's too late. It's gone too far. You can't turn it back. This is it. It's too late. Leave him alone. Don't pray any longer. Don't stand any longer. Don't be afraid. Jesus said, what? Only believe? You should be made well. Blind Bartimaeus. You understand I could spend time on every one of these, but I'm, I'm being behaved. Blind Bartimaeus. Mark the 10th chapter 46 through 52. All right? Now, in Matthew's gospel and in Luke's gospel, it says there was another man with Bart Bartimaeus. But we'll deal with just Bartimaeus here. So Bartimaeus, you know, they, they, Jesus walking by, they hear about Jesus. They say, Lord, have mercy on us. And Jesus says this to him. He says, go your way. Whose faith? Your faith has made you well. The nobleman. The nobleman has a man, his son. His son is dying. I really like this one. This is not one that stands out in Scripture, but I really like it because of what it says. We just get down to the latter part, because I, 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 the latter part where, where we're going to read here. So the man believed the what? Let's read that together. So the man believed the word. His son's dying. So the man believed the what? The word. That Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And it says, and his son was healed that self-same hour. The ten lepers. Again, ten lepers crying out for mercy. They're standing afar off at a distance because that's what they have to do. Lepers are the outcasts of society. They are on the edge of the community. They, they, they are always left outside of town. Nobody else wants to get it. So they're separated from it. They're hollering from a distance. Lord, have mercy. Help us. Jesus said, go do the things that are required. Go show yourself to the priests. And so the ten start to go to the temple and go see the priest. And it says, as they were going, they were cleansed. And everyone else says, and one man. One man, as he saw he was cleansed, he turned and he worshipped him and gave thanks. And Jesus said to this one man, all right? Now, here's a little bit of difference in this verse. Nine of them, their leprosy ceased. It stopped. It was cleansed. All right? Whatever they may have lost, a finger, an ear, some disfigurement, but it was cleansed. Now, listen, that's a lease on life. Did nobody going to complain about that? All right? They had the death sentence. But one man, he stopped and gave thanks. And Jesus said to him, Sit arise, go your way. Thy faith made thee what? Complete. If he lost a finger, he had a finger. If he was disfigured, he was disfigured. No longer. Whatever the case. Only one man. Now they were all cleansed. But one man, he says, Thy faith. The rest of it was a sovereign act of God. This man was made whole because of his faith. Now, see, here, here's, here's the challenge. All right? We're like the, uh, the, the tenth example that I'm going to use. Now, there are two other examples, and both of them deal with the mute. But in those cases, 
It is just, it is just the, the best I can tell, just the sovereign will of God. And in both those cases, uh, 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 it's a mute man. One is mute and, and blind, and the other one is he not only can't speak, but he can't hear. All right? Neither one of those does he say anything about their faith. It is, just, it is just the generosity and the goodness of God. I realize it's always the goodness of God, but it, it attributes nothing to their faith. All right? Here's the challenge. We say, Lord, I believe, but Lord, I still struggle. We are like the tenth example. And it's a man who has a boy who often uh, would have a, we would call it epilepsy. He'd often have an epileptic fit and throw himself into the fire or throw himself in the water. It many times had tried to destroy him, to cause him to kill himself. So it's not just epilepsy. He'd throw himself in the fire. He'd throw himself into the water. There's other stuff. He says, he says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. We used this last week. If you can do it, do something. Jesus said, if you can believe. It's not about whether or not I can. It's whether or not you can believe. We used this last week. Can you believe? He says, all things are possible to him who what believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out, and he said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And that is where the overwhelming majority of people are at. Even when we get to the point we believe that he's able, and we, we, we come to a point that we would believe that he's, he's even willing, we struggle with whether or not that he really will. Lord, I believe... Help my, help my unbelief. Now, remember I said this. There are 12 instances where individuals came and, brought Je- and were brought to Jesus. In 10 of those 12, he mentions their faith. All right? As El Presidente would say, this is huge. <laughs> this is huge. Ten of the twelve instances here, he mentions their faith. Now, words matter. Now, again, I could tell you, you know, well, this is what I think, and and this is what I've seen happen, and and, and this is what people tell me, and this is what I was taught. But uh, now, I've, I've just read the Scripture, and it speaks for itself. Again, it's not a Hebrew problem. It's not a Greek problem. It's just pure old English. But over the years, the church has shied away from these things. Remember, did I tell you there were 10 times that he healed huge crowds of people? There are 27 instances where he healed somebody or did a miracle. That's just in the four Gospels. And it said, all right, and many other things that he did. All right, so this is the overview. This is not everything. This is the overview that we see. Ten of the twelve instances where somebody came to him or were brought to him. So you might say you approach him in prayer for yourself or you're approaching him for someone else. Ten of the twelve mentions what? Their faith. See, we, we struggle. We struggle with endeavoring to believe. Now, I'm going I'm to get to another answer. I just wanted to make the case. Now, I don't like to make indictments, all right, and say, well, you know, the problem, you know, you just make a generalization and all you do is just discourage people and hurt people. And I, I, I have an answer, okay? But we have to accept the fact that there, there's a problem with faith. Ten of the twelve. He said it had to do with, again, their faith. I could take you back to the story with the four men who brought the one young man in. The scripture clearly says, and the power of God was present to heal, but only one got healed. But yet it says, it's very clear, and the power of God was present to heal, but only one man got healed. Right. Mark the ninth chapter, verses 18 and 19. Remember... The boy that threw himself into the fire and into the water, and he'd often tried to kill himself, and his father said, Lord, help us if you can do anything. Please, please help us. 
we've spoke to your disciples, it says. They, they should cast it out, this spirit and get in him and use his, his illness to try to cause him to kill himself. But they could not. He answered him and he said, what did he say? Is that what it says? Wow. You know, we just, we just gloss over. We just gloss over and just, we just keep going. What did he say? Oh, faithless generation, how long will I be with you? How long will I bear with you? Bring him to me. Now, he didn't say they couldn't. What did he say they were? Now, that's, that, that's huge, and I'm not, certainly not suggesting that, that all believers are faithless. I do say that there probably is a, a faith problem in the church today, and there's, there's lots of reasons for it. You know, you know that we, we, we live in a time of advancement, technology, the pace of life. We live in a culture embalmed in doubt and unbelief. And then we're, we're, we're so committed to science fiction, folks, that I think that it influences the... Did you hear what I said? We are so committed to science fiction. Should I say it again? No, I think you heard me. <laughs> that if we're not careful, we begin to think the Scripture's science fiction. Oh, faithless generation, how long will I be with you? How long will I bear you? All right. Look at Luke, the 18th chapter in verse 8. This is my best. This is my hammer on the nail. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes. Is Jesus coming? He is, isn't he? Is Jesus coming? All right. If you had a red letter edition and, you know, you had your red letter edition out right here, this would be red letter. All right. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find what? You ever think about that before? When he comes, will he find faith on the earth? All right? Our first problem is that this generation, all right, this culture, this age that we live in, you know, when I say generation, I'm not talking about millennials, all right? I'm saying this age, this time, this culture we live in. There is a crisis of faith, a crisis of faith. Do you know less than half the church believes in the virgin birth? How are they going to get how are they ever going to get a miracle? Much of the church doesn't even believe the devil's real. And that's where sickness and disease comes from. How are you going to fight the enemy if you don't believe there's an enemy? Romans the 10th chapter, verses 17 and 18. So then faith comes how? And hearing by the word of God. But I say they have not heard. You, we don't read that part, do we, Linda? So then faith comes what? By hearing. And hearing by the word of God. But they have not heard. Kind of an interesting statement, isn't it? Now then you have to pose the question. I often believe to be able to get the right answers, you've got to ask the right questions. If they have not heard, then why? Reasonable question, isn't it, Dennis? If they've not heard, then why? Now we're talking about faith here. If you would look specifically at the context of that scripture, it's talking about faith to get saved, but it covers just faith. All right? Why have they not heard? Well, first of all, I'd say, what are we hearing or what are we listening to? What are we hearing? Here's the second one. What are we preaching? How can they hear unless there's a preacher? And how can he be unless he be sent? I'd say there's two problems. It's what we listen to in the church and what we preach in the church. I could have people raise their hands this morning and be the overwhelming majority, and I'd say in the last four weeks you've heard more four, in the last four weeks you've heard more healing scriptures than you ever heard in your entire life. Not all the church, not all the church, but many. Now that's not an indictment on you. 
I often said this. <laughs> no, no, I better leave that. <laughs> I better leave that. Okay. So that's not an indictment on you. That's, that's an indictment on the pulpit. All right? You might say, we got a pee-pee problem. I said, Bill, it sounds bad. Yeah. We got a pew problem, what you listen to. We got a pulpit problem, what we preach. What we preach. Faith comes by what? If you've heard more healing scripture in the last four weeks than you've heard in your entire life, then how in the world, if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, how can there be faith for that? What if we never teach that? What if we never preach salvation? Let me remind you, salvation is the most important thing there is. We are not elevating healing over, we don't, we don't elevate anything over salvation. Jesus come to save us from our sin. But the same price that he paid for the forgiveness of sin was the same price that he paid for healing for the physical body. Now, that is not to say that we don't get attacked, that we, you know, that we, we don't live in a fallen world, that people don't... I, I, I know we do. But healing's available because we get attacked. There's a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. We get a hearing problem. What are we listening to? And we get a preaching problem. I told Peggy this a few weeks ago. Do you know what, you know, I'm like everybody, I follow everything. You know what we fall in love with today, and that's sound bites. Sound bites. And so many times, them sound bites are not even, you know, it's not even scripture. So we love all these sound bites, and we post them, and we repost them, and we post them, and we repost them. I'll tell you what, post this week. By his stripes, I'm healed. So I, I told you, what, I, I went to a prayer service. I went to a prayer service. Outside of quoting the scripture that was the theme for the service, it was the only scripture shared about prayer. 30 minutes of preaching. What are we preaching? And then what were they hearing? So Romans, boy, you can read that whole context there, and it, but it's, it's just really pr pretty clear, you know, that there's a real challenge. And, and I do think that there's, a, you know, the, 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 there is something, because the Word of God says that there's, there's something. I think it's important to read it. I'm, I believe it's important to listen to. But there is something about whatever you preach from the pulpit, God using it in the hearts of people and building faith. He said, faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing by the word of God. How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall he go unless he be sent? It's talking about the preached word, isn't it, Dennis? I didn't, I'd make that up. I'd make that up. That's what it says. i got to keep going here. Mark 6, chapter. All right. So there's a faith crisis. There really is. All right. I can't answer everything this morning, but you know, and again, and I'm just dealing with two deals, two deals. I, I'm telling you, I deal with it. You, we, we all deal with it. But until we admit that there's a crisis, you can't deal with the crisis. You know, this country's got, got a $19.5 trillion debt, and we're living in oblivia. They're acting like it's not a crisis. $19.5 trillion. Our great-great-grandchildren are not going to pay it off. What if you went out and bought an elaborate place and it took four generations to pay for it? What would your neighbors say for you to you? What if the bank would lend you money on that? What would the people say about the bank? I'm getting my money out of there. That isn't safe. You know, you do something long enough and it becomes the norm. Dysfunctional becomes functional. I tell you that there is a faith crisis. We all deal with it. I'm not saying, hey, therefore, there's me and there's you. No, I'm saying it's generational. It's the day and time in which we live in. Jesus didn't have a lot of, but you can see he didn't have a lot of patience for it. You faithless generation. You remember when he went to Jairus' household? I'm really doing pretty good on time if you saw everything I had. <clears throat> Listen. Remember when J.R.S. went to his household? There were people who said, ah, it's too late. Don't bother him. Leave him alone. You know what he did? He ran him out of the room. 
he wouldn't even pray with them in the room. Wouldn't even pray with them in the room. Oh, wouldn't even pray with them in the room. He ran them out of the room. How many times you've been in a room trying to pray for somebody and everybody telling you how bad it is, how terrible it is. Boy, this is awful. We're not going to make it. They had no need to pray it now. Oh, God bless them. I'm telling the truth, aren't I? All right, Mark the 6th chapter, verse 2. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, many hearing him what were astonished at his saying. Where did this man get these things? They, liked, they said, "Why this is this preaching. Why, man, we've never heard such preaching. Why, this is good preaching. Oh. Where did this man, why, where did he get these things? Well, maybe they're not so excited about the preaching. Maybe they think he's nuts. I guarantee there will be people watch this online and they think I'm crazy. I don't care. And they said, they were astonished. Where'd this man get, where'd you get this stuff? You know, you, you preach it, you preach a four messages on healing. And people say, where do you get that stuff? I called it the B-I-B-L-E. Where'd you get your doubt and unbelief? You didn't get it from the same book I got this from, I can tell you that. Where did this man get these things? And with what wisdom and which it's given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands. That's verse 2. Verse 3. Oh, oh no, oh no, oh no. Is this not the carpenter? Now, sometimes it's not what you said, it's who said it. Is this not the carpenter? Oh, that's Mary's son. We all know about Mary, don't we? Ha, ha, ha. You don't think that's what they're thinking? Yeah. And then the kids that was born after she got married, James and Joas and Judah and Simon and his sisters. Oh, yeah, that's what they're thinking. Who's this child of an illegitimate woman? Son of a carpenter. Think he is. Look at there. And they were offended at him. But Jesus said, a prophet's not without honor except in his own country. Now I circle... They were offended. Remember I told you there is a crisis of faith? Is this a, we have problems that are pervasive in the church. You can always find individual things. You know, you could, you could be living in fear, fear, but that doesn't mean I'm living in fear. All right, Or I might be in fear, that doesn't mean you are. I'm, you know, I, 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 I may have doubt based upon my past and, 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 and the things I've gone through, and I may have be having lots of struggles with the fatherhood of God or something like that, but that doesn't mean you do. I'm talking about things that are pervasive. These are things that I believe that is keeping us from seeing. Now, he's the same, but we don't see the same results. And why? Well, one, I, once again, I think I've made a great case. There's a crisis of faith. Two, offense is rampant in the church. Offense is rampant in the church. Rampant. And they were offended at him. Look what he says. Verses 5 and 6. He could do no mighty work. Stop. Who's it talking about here? Jesus. Son of God. Pre-existed one. All God, all man. The one who walks on water. The one who was there when the foundations of the world were created. When God spoke the world and, and drove back the waters and, and, and land burst forth. The one who said light be and light is. The one who was in the beginning was with God and was God. What did it say? And he could do no mighty work. Why? I got a right to 
be offended. He could do no mighty works there. Now listen to this. Read this. Read this with me. Except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. I read this several years ago and I thought, that sounds like the church today. That's what we see. Every great once in a while, we see a few sick people healed, John. Oh, man, and we're excited. <laughs> Remember the top line? He didn't do any mighty work. There was no withered hand. There's not no blind eye. The mute's not speaking. But we get a few sick people healed. And it justifies our reason for having prayer groups. Now, and I'm not against prayer groups. Don't get me wrong. You got people coming to your prayer groups that are living in a fence with everybody. You wonder why your prayer groups groups aren't getting any answers. Now, I'm not saying kick them out because I know you just create another offense, all right? <laughs> I know how that would work. All right? But I'm saying there's a pervasive problem in the church with offenses. We are unforgiving, we are vengeful, and we justify it. And I tell you, that is the place. Years ago, when I first preached it, golly, this must have been about 1992, I preached a message, Jim will remember, a place called there. There he could do no mighty work. Where? The place of offense. Now stay with me, though. That's one verse, isn't it? Didn't the Bible say in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established? All right. Now, so all the church can do once again today is just get a few people, sick people healed. All right, why? Because that's where what? We're offended. The second greatest problem all right, we have is, is we said the first one is unbelief. The second one is being offended. Uh, uh, not this October, the October for four. So October of 215, we did a series called Scandal On. I had folks quit coming to church while I preached that message. Here's what the scandal, when it, the word offended means, scan, it's where we get the word scandal. The scandal, all right, the scandal is, is that people are offended. Scandal's a stumbling block. It means this, to distrust or desert one that you ought to trust. That's what offense does. It causes us to desert the one we ought to trust. 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verse 18. 1 Corinthians 11th chapter, just to condense this down because for lack of time, is that this is where we're talking about communion, the Lord's Supper. We're serving the elements, the body, you know, the bread, the body of Christ, the, the cup, the, the wine, the juice, the blood of Christ. All right. In this, he's talking about the, also talking about the order of service and how a service should act. And, and there's a lot of problems there in, in the Corinthian church. And, and uh, they've turned their communion... There are times of getting together, because see, they had communion every week. And communion is turned into a big bash. It's a party. All right? It's a party. And there were those who had, and they would get together, and boy, they would bring all their food and have a big time, and then there'd be all those who didn't have. All part of the same church. Now, Paul says this to them, 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, verse 18. Did I tell you about offense? They were offended he couldn't do anything. They mighty, listen, listen to this. For in the first place, when you assemble as a congregation, I've had, I've had in this church, this is a good church too, you, you know, you're, this is a good church. I, don't, I, I, I highly recommend you, highly. But I've had people in this church who wouldn't eat downstairs with certain people. Well, no wonder people sick. Take responsibility. For in the first place, when you assemble together as a congregation, I hear that there are cliques, divisions, factions among you. And in part, I believe it. Stay with me. So we go on through, and he gets to the part. He says, you know, in 1 Corinthians 12, chapter, verse 23, he said, As I've received of the Lord Jesus, I also deliver unto you that the same night when he's betrayed, he took bread and he break it. Drop all the way down, all right? <clears throat> now, in the 12th chapter, he says, for as the body is one, 
and he hath many members. I, I, I want to I take a scripture out of the 12th chapter. I got ahead of myself. For as the body is one, hath many members, all right? The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. I know people wouldn't even sit with a Pentecostal. I know people wouldn't sit with a Catholic. Now, I'm talking about people who believe in Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? I'm, we're going to get to heaven. I've changed my mind about two or three things over the years. And none of us write about everything. He says, uh, he says we're all part of that. You can't say to the eye, uh, the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor can the head say to the feet, I, I have no need of you. All right? Remember, there's cliques, there's schisms, there's divisions, he said, among you. All right? Now, is it our understanding that believers make up the body of Christ? Is that our understanding? All right? You're part of the body, I'm part of the body, I don't know who's the, the, the toe and the hand and the, all that other stuff, but we're all part of the body, right? Somewhere in there, all right? 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, verses 29 and 30. Now, this is where Paul begins to talk about the Lord's Supper. I, I said in verse 23, as I've received of the Lord, I deliver to you. He begins to talk to them about the elements. Verse 29. For anyone who eats or drinks without recognizing what? Who's the body? Whoa. Who's the body? If you don't recognize the body, all right? Of the Lord, eats and drinks what? On what? We're killing ourselves. This is why, or that is why, many among you are what? Weak. What else does it say? Sick. And a number have what? Now, it didn't say they went to hell but said they died early. That's pretty conclusive, isn't it? I tell you, there's reasons today that so many people don't get healed. As much as it depends upon you, walk peaceably with all men. As much as it depends upon you. I will tell you, it is a life or death situation. It is. Walking in love is this. Remember we talked about, you know, what's good health cost? Walking in love is the premium. Offense is the high deductible that you cannot afford. So for this soundbite generation, there's your soundbite. All right? Walking in love is the premium. Offense is a high deductible. Jesus went to his hometown there. He could do nothing mighty except he laid hands and he healed a few sick folk. All right. I mean, you, can, you, can, you, you even read that. My goodness, is that played now. I mean, he, he, he is, there, there was a disappointment. He goes on to say that he, he marveled at their unbelief. Offense leads to unbelief. All right. These two issues, when we're talking about faith and being offended, or faith and walking in love, these two issues are inseparable. You cannot live by faith without walking in love. You can't live by faith without walking in love. Galatians 5, 6, I've got to quit. For we all, for all we need, is faith working through love. I could make a... Jesus looked out over the, the crowd, and, and it says, and he had compassion on them, and he healed them. It, what was it? It was faith working by love. The Roman centurion came to Jesus, and it says, and he loved the servant. It was, what? It was faith working by love. The Syrophesian woman come because of her daughter, and what does she do? She loves her daughter the man with the son who often throws his son into the fire, please, please help my son. Why? Because he loves him. It's what? It's faith working by love. The four friends bring the man and they drop him down through the roof. And what is it? It is faith working by love. 
it is incumbent upon us to do everything that we can to walk in love. It's incumbent upon us to make sure that we're listening to those things that which build our faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, sometimes we're, we're not very far off. We're just, we're just enough off that we just can't quite hit the mark. Many times we're, we're praying with a whole group of people and we're doing the very best we can to carry the whole load. You ever been there? Yeah. It's a fight. The fight's worth it. Next week we'll, talk, we'll address the issue of faith because I think it's not fair to take it this far and then not address the issue of faith and endeavor to, to do what we can to, to uh, come underneath that and support it and, and, and help us in those areas. Again, I, I think these are pervasive things in our, our generation, time we live in. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? He questions it. He's, he's concerned about it. One who knows and holds the future. I, I would think that, that it would be something that we would also want to give attention to. Every head bowed, no one looking around for just a brief minute. You might be here, and we've talked about healing. You know, God heals everything, spirit, soul, and body. And the way he'll heal your spirit is to get you saved, bring you into a right relationship with him. You might be here this morning, and maybe you've never made a decision concerning the person of Jesus Christ. He really is God's own son. He really did die on the cross, and there he died for you. He was raised from the dead. And the Bible says that right now he sits at the right hand of the Father and he's praying for you. Hebrews says, ever liveth to make intercession. He's praying for you. Heaven's pulling for you. Heaven's plan is not that people wouldn't, that would miss it and not go to heaven. Heaven's plan is he would that all men would be saved. But we have to make a decision. Our faith plays a role. Can you believe these things? Can you believe that Jesus really is the Son of God? Can you believe He lived a sinless life? Can you believe that He died on the cross and He died for you? And lots of times people say yes. Do you believe He was raised from the dead? And if you can still say yes, then you've got one more thing you've got to do, though. You say, well, I answered all the questions right. No, there's something else you've got to do. Romans, the 10th chapter. Remember, the, the Bible speaks for itself. You don't have to join this church. You don't have to have a Sunday school pen. You have to call him Lord. The Bible says if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart we believe, with our mouth our profession is made. If you're here this morning and you've never said, Lord Jesus, come into my life, save me, cleanse me, forgive me. We're going to pray right now. The Bible says we can pray one for another, so let's all pray together. If you've wandered in your faith, would you pray and would you reconnect, recommit yourself, reestablish? Maybe you've, you've picked the reins back up. He's no longer the Lord. He's no longer in charge. Would, you, would re, you reaffirm that he's the Lord? He's the one in charge. See, we're not just talking about getting saved. We're talking about changing lordship. When you confess him as Lord, you say, you take over my life. I am committed to following you. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. We're going to pray. Pray together with us. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus. I believe that He lived. I believe that He died. On the cross, I believe He died for me. I believe He was buried. Jesus was raised from the dead. Lord Jesus, come into my heart, save me, cleanse me, forgive me. I accept you now as my Lord and as my Savior. I receive forgiveness of sin. 
and the free gift of eternal life. Old things are passed away. Old sin, old hurt, old habits, they're all passed away. Everything is new. Thank you for a brand new heart and a brand new beginning. You're my Lord. And I'm your child. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen.